Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Adam Best. Adam is a former naval officer and the host of the Veterans in the Wild podcast. He has a deep passion for helping military veterans in their transition to life after the military. And I'm excited to have him on the show to talk about it and a lot of other leadership issues. So Adam, welcome to the show. John, it's great to be here. It's been really fun to get to know you and I'm excited to see where this conversation goes. Yeah, me too. We have a lot in common. We both were uh, naval officers um, and uh, we both transitioned out of the Navy into uh, into the, the non-military world, I guess. And uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that and you know what your transition was like and uh, things that you learned through that process. But first of all, tell us about your, your naval experience. I know you're a surface warfare officer. Tell us about how you went in and why you chose to go in that route. I, I was probably born to do two things. I was probably born to go to Penn State. Um, my dad went to Penn State. All four of his children went to Penn State. And I, um, I was the only one who was born saying, I'm going to go to Penn State. But I was the only one who applied to any other school, the United States Naval Academy. Mm. And they said, um, maybe, maybe not. But you look good. <laughs> so I earned a commission through uh, ROTC <laughs> at my favorite school in the world, Penn State. Um, <laughs> but the United States Navy was five of the best years of my life. Um, and I've heard of people who, uh, this chief was a little difficult or you know, ah, the CO kind of ruined the ship. I, I, I didn't have that. I had two COs who I, if I had stayed in, I would have been, you know, I wish I would have been, uh, I think he retired as Captain Eric Wellenman, and I think he's still in, and he should be Admiral. Um, <laughs> I only know him as Cowboy Larry, because that's what we called him. Uh, Larry, <laughs> Larry Liguri. Um They were just guys who, um, Wyland men just held us to standards and he just, he just did a great job. He just like, I gave him a contact report from the bridge one day and I told him, sir, it doesn't look like he's underway, which I was so young. I wasn't even the officer of the deck. I was learning to be the officer deck, so I was still in training. And I was like, sir, it doesn't look like he's underway. And he said, Mr. Best. And I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> Here it comes. <laughs> yeah, because as you know, like usually officers, especially in private, refer to each other in the first name because it's sort of our like only time to be like humans because normally we're always Mr. Best or sir or ma'am or like. Yep, or lieutenant. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah we have to be a professional. He said, Mr. Best, I was like, oh, I screwed up. He's like, Mr. Best, what's the definition of underway? And I said, I don't know, sir. And he said, figure it out and call me back. And I said, yes, sir. And that was the very first time I said, yes, sir. Hung up the phone and started the tradition of, I'll figure that one out, sir. <laughs> And started the tradition of calling people back after I humbly ate some human pie or humble pie and started calling them back with the correct answer. But that was a lesson. That was the first lesson where it was like, hey, my officers know the definition of underway. And I can tell you still to this day, it's a ship or a vessel not anchored aground or made fast to a pier. Right. And if you look up, yeah, exactly. And you know it too. And you said, yes, that's exactly what the, <laughs> that's exactly what the Coast Guard regulations say. But in that very moment, he taught me exactly what it is, and I still know what it is. Yeah, I think you you hit on something that's really important. And that is, you know, one is they held us to high standards, which is important, right? And the second thing was and I love this, and I talk about it uh, a lot in my leadership writing, is they let us fail. They put us in as junior officer of the deck with, you know, 
we had some training. I mean, we, you know, we, we were trained to do it, but we'd never done it before. And they let us kind of trip over ourselves a little bit. And the one thing powerful about failure is that you learn from it, right? You, if you, like you said, you'll never forget that definition because you failure is emotional, right? It's embarrassing. It's uh, and, and and we always remember those things. So yeah, I, I really do think that the lessons that we learn, at least I learned in the Navy, are powerful because they they were, you know, in some cases we were put in difficult situations that we'd never been in before in our lives, and um, and we screwed up a lot. <laughs> We, yep. And we were, and we learned those lessons. I think that's really powerful. And it's yep. good to hear too, that you had good, two uh, good skippers on your boat that you really could, um, you know, that you could learn from and um, respect, right. And have a good experience. And, and I think I, I certainly did have a good experience as well. So that's yeah. really good to hear. Now, what, uh, what ship were you on? I was on very, very, very different ships. I was on a destroyer, which is the Cadillac of the surface Navy. Yes. Those things can you know, do somersaults on, you know, not somersaults, but circles. Yeah. Yeah. They can, they, they drive and they're, they can go from 30 to zero and zero to 35 in a heartbeat. Yeah. And there's probably nothing more exciting to be on the bridge and go, Hey, engineer, we're going to go fast. I need <laughs> all the horsepower you've got. <laughs> and see, I see you smiling because I know you've been back in the engineering department going, we need some more power. <laughs> we need more power. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. You, you've yeah. heard those steam bells coming back and they go. Psh, psh. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, those things are really fun when you can drive them at 30 plus knots. Um, <laughs> but the other ship was, a um, it was an LPD, uh, Landing transport dock is the official name of them, which has no meaning to anybody, even people <laughs> in, the, in the Navy. Um, but it takes Marines. It takes um, takes them, puts them on a ship, and puts them with an ability, puts them onto a beach. Yeah. And the very best thing I got up out of that professionally on the Navy from going from the Cadillac, which... What the Cadillac did was one mission really, really, really well. It went fast really well, or it launched a small boat at one time, or it got fuel well. But that's all it did, and it only did sailors. The LPD transported Marines, and it also did a lot of things. We used the land helicopter. And two minutes later, we said, okay, the bird's secured. Stop all the, the aviation things. Stop that. Okay, that's, that's good. We're about to launch an LCAC out of the well deck down below. Okay, and then we're going to stop all that. We're going to go back to helicopter ops. Stop that. We're going to go back down to the well deck. So all that variety, like I think I learned everything I could have about the service Navy in three seconds. And then yeah. I got the Navy after I blinked. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. What a different experience. Like you said, one's the sort of the Ferrari, you know, the Cadillac or the Ferrari, of the fleet. And the other one is like a workhorse, you know, just uh, fully like a Swiss army knife can do a lot of different things. And uh, that's, uh, that's neat. And um, so you, um, you were in the two, the two, uh, two ships and then um, so you decided to transition out. You decided to leave the Navy. Um, so what were some, what were some, what went into some of that decisions about leaving the military after you were in for five years? Well, I was young and dumb <laughs> because now I'm sitting here talking to you and I'm 38 and I'm, uh, five years away from getting that military retirement. And I'm kind of like, well, that'd be really, 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 really nice. <laughs> <laughs> you and I both understand that. Um, my big thing was I loved driving ships. I didn't like fighting ships. I didn't like bureaucracy. Ironically, after I left the Navy, I went back into the federal government intentionally because 
between my active duty Navy time and then I spent five more years in the federal government. So I do have a pension coming when I'm 62. And that's something that um, veterans getting out need to realize is that you can take your uh, service time, apply it to government service time and get a pension. That's very valuable. So I will have a check coming to me in the mail. Never mind. It's certainly not going to come in the mail. <laughs> but I'll have a check coming, you know, when I'm retired or at least, you know, older age. So that's very valuable, of course. Um, <clears throat> but that's really why I joined the Navy. I wanted to drive ships. I loved my, my dad had a boat when I was younger. That's, that was my drive to the Navy. <clears throat> um, I did want to command a ship, but I just, I think it got too political and that's that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, you know, there's just, there's an, there's an attrition program, right? Only a certain amount of people get to command a ship, only a certain amount of people make admiral, but there's a lot of junior officers. There was a lot of us. <laughs> we, we were the, uh, we were the incoming, right? So there was a lot of us that got a chance to, you know, experience what, what, what Navy like life is like and get to drive. I didn't drive ships. I drove, drove boats. Um, but, um, but yeah, it was, uh, that same with me. I mean, I enjoyed that part of it. I, I enjoyed, um, uh, you know, driving the boat and I, I didn't, I hated engineering. I had to become a nuke to be a submariner, but that wasn't my, that wasn't my thing. Like I was like, a yes. it was a means to an end. So I was an engineer, but my goal was to get it, you know, to become officer's deck. That was all I cared about. And, um, yep. and then once I did that, that was just like, that was heaven on earth. I loved every, every minute of, uh, uh, being officer deck. It's just something I really, really enjoyed. So, yep. um, you know, it's interesting. So, you know, talk a little bit about your transition, because one of the things that was struggle, I struggled with a little bit is that I was very important on the boat. I was a uh, maneuvering watch OOD. I was the OOD on the mid watch. I was the guy that when the captain needed somebody, I was that officer of the deck. I was important. And then when I left the military, I came in, uh, worked for corporate America. And I, my first job was a associate design engineer uh, working at a big corporation. They gave me a cubicle and a stapler. And about two months later, I got a computer. That was my life. For two months, I wandered around, not sure what I was supposed to be doing. And it was, uh, I went from being important to being, um, I don't know, a cubicle dweller, I guess, the best way to describe it. So tell, tell me <clears throat> about your experience and what that was like going from, you know, driving, driving ships, doing these great operations to, you know, move, you know, suddenly you're not wearing a uniform anymore. So your listeners need to hear that we did not plan this one. This is not staged. Um, I was my ship's OD as well, or at least that was my, that was my mentality. But my favorite thing to do in the world was either to take the ship to sea or to take it back from sea. Um, my last, what I consider my last day in the Navy was literally bringing the ship home, being the OD from sea into port from our deployment, like literally the last day of our deployment in which we did what the service Navy calls a tire cruise, I assume, or I don't know if the sub can do something similar. We did. Yeah. We, I'd only done one. I did one dependence cruise. We didn't do a full yeah. tiger cruise, but I did one dependence <clears throat> cruise during my time, but, uh, and, and that's a whole funny story in and of itself, but, uh, but, uh, <laughs> So, now let me ask you a question. When you on your last your last watch is OOD, did you do anything crazy? Because I did, and I was just curious about it. As you took the took the ship in for the last, <clears> time, did you do anything special as OOD? Yeah, I I had my parents there oh. with me. Oh, that's cool. And I had my my father in law, who was a, a twenty four year, year retired Navy guy, who did uh, um what's now it he would have been a radio man and then commissioned as a uh warrant officer so they were on they were on board for the tiger uh tiger cruise that that's awesome so they got to be there on your last uh your last watch yeah it was it was really cool because like since it was the second ship was the marine thing we 
um, brought the Marines home to North Carolina. The ship was based out of Virginia. So we <clears throat> brought the Marines home, picked up the families for the Navy guys or the Navy personnel. Sorry. Um, and then Navy and their family drove the ship home from North Carolina to Virginia. And so it was cool to have my parents, my father-in-law, particularly because he could kind of tell them the stuff I couldn't tell them, especially because I was on watch to take the ship home. Yeah. But it was also great. cool to like have my parents be like, oh, my kids driving the ship home. Yeah. But it was really cool to also like ships home. I'm out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Do, I went on 30 days eternal leave and said, <laughs> yep. <laughs> what, what was I, I had mixed feelings on my last uh you know because we you know i was on the bridge um i didn't have the maneuvering watch od i actually had the, the mid watch before we came into port before um and so i had the mid watch on the surface by the you know taking the taking the boat to the sea buoy and then kind of hanging out all night you know before we came in in the morning and so for me after my last watch i had this long climb down the uh the conning tower down to the control room and that was bittersweet for me to know that I would never climb that ladder again and never stand that watch as surface OD. And I, you know, even to this day, I, 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 I really, I have definitely mixed feelings coming down that ladder. And uh, even to this day, I, I miss that probably more than anything is, is, is standing those watches on the bridge uh, when the, you know, when the boat was on the surface. So you know, what, what kind of feelings were you going through as you went through that, you know, transition to, you know, man, I just turned over the watch. It's, it's done, you know, the, 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 the you know, it's tied up to the pier. I'm walking across the gangplank. It's 30 days, you know, terminal leave and I'm out. I mean, what kind of emotions did you go through? I think it was probably cool because it was, my parents were there. I came home and like the, my girlfriend was on the pier. Who's not my wife. Um, and it was spiking it for like coming home from deployment. Yeah. So I probably didn't realize just all of that. And kind of like you asked me before, like, what was your transition? Like I fell flat on my face. Mm. And that's not <laughs> uncommon. I mean, it's not uncommon. We, we go from, no, I mean, I seriously, it's a big issue. We go from having a brotherhood, having a mission, having a, uh, a North star, if you will, in our lives in the military to like, oh, I'm in this big company. I don't know what to do. I, you know, I, I I'm renting a house for the first time. I, I don't know how to do life. Right. I don't have to wear a uniform. I don't even know what to wear to work. You know, um, we always, you know, we had the uniform of the day, right. You just wore that. It was pretty easy. So you've said you fell flat on your face. What do you mean by that? I think a lot of it was the loss of, Purpose, yeah. I mean, you're literally going, taking a ship out there in the middle of the ocean, leaving everything you know. So that gives you like a lot of loss, but it's also like, why am I doing this? Oh, yeah. because it's so important to me to defend this country and defend our way of life. Why am I going to go work at Walmart now? Oh, because I want a paycheck. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's that's a big difference. But I also think why I struggled, why a lot of people struggled. First, it's like you used to walk into a room and say, okay, I have a gold bar on my shoulder. He has an anchor. I know how he and I interact. He has you know, that on his shoulder. I know how we interact. But it's also, I walk onto the ship or the boat in the morning and I pick up this piece of paper and it says exactly what we're going to do here called the plan of the day. And you walk into a company and just like you said, this is really why I went from, I did go from the active duty Navy the military to um, the federal government, a very smart, like that's a smart move, right? You could retire from the federal government. You can get a nice paycheck. It's good benefits. It's, a modest, very good life, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. One day I walked out of my boss's office. He was the only one who really had an office. And I walked back into the sea of cubicles. And I said, 
this could be my life for the next 30 years. Yeah. 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 No, you, it, you got it. It, 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 I was in it for 22. So, <laughs> but yeah, not just not it. like I could have found fun in like maybe something that went from maybe a little bigger cubicle because I had that tiny little desk just like you did. But also, you know, maybe if it went from there and then like went to sea for three days. And I still say that about the Navy. I wish, I wish I could go back for a week, 10 oh, days. hundred percent. I, I just, I miss the smells. I miss the activity. I miss the mm -hmm. everything about it. Going down to the mess deck, see what's being, you know, what's being, what's cooking, uh, heading back to the engine room, talking to my buddies and maneuvering. And, you know, yeah. I just, just, there's so much sense smells. I mean, I spent two years of my life underwater, you know, that, yep. and I'll never, I can't, I'll never forget that. Right. I mean, it's two solid years of my life under the ocean. That's just in your DNA. Now at this point, it's, it's hard coded. And, you know, occasionally like, like a diesel truck will go by and I'll smell diesel fume. And I'm like, Oh, I'm back on the boat. It's like, I'm right there. It's just it's <clears> like, I've been on uh, I've been on some like museum um, submarines and you go down the hatch and there's like that smell. I don't know what it is that smell, but I'm like, oh, I'm home. Like this is this is where I belong. I don't belong in a cubicle. I don't belong in corporate America. I belong at sea. And it's it was. <clears throat> I, I tell you, to me at least, I <clears throat> I, I similar. I, I struggle a little bit to like, okay, you know, where's my north star now? What am I going to do? What's what's my role in life now? I always wanted to be a submarine officer. I did that. Now what do I do? You know. That's another big thing is like, what do I do now uh, that I'm out? And, and, you know, for me, at least it, it turned out I had, I had luckily um, probably about eight years into my civilian career, I had an epiphany that I, what I really enjoyed was, was leading manufacturing businesses. And eventually I, I, I got, a, got, got an opportunity to lead eight different manufacturing businesses. And that, that was my passion. That was my joy. That was my my new North star, but it took me eight years out of the military to find that I was actually a plant manager for three years. And I was like, I don't know if I want to do this. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm trying to do my best, but it was the next plant. I had my second plant where I went, this is where I want to be. I want to be with these people. I want to improve this operation. This is my passion. This is my new North star, but it took me a long time. And I know, um, as you, you know, your, your passion is, helping veterans in that transition, it's, it's trying to find that new, your, your new mission in life, right? Is that the big issue that you see as you talk about these issues and talk to people about this? Yeah, I think a lot of it is a couple of things. A lot of it is almost everyone joins the military out of high school. So it's out of the life that they, you know, you're born you're yeah, right. you're a kid, life. right? Yeah, yeah, you're a kid. Yeah. You're a kid. That's the life you know. The next right. life you know is the military. So then you go on to the next thing and you're like, oh, I have to reinvent myself again. But a lot of what when I was kind of thinking back is like it is, we we would both call it Navy life, but it's military life. It's you work with the people that you also hang out with, the people that you deploy with, the people yeah. that you would take a bullet for, the people that are your coworkers, the same people that if you ask me for a reference on a resume, I'm still putting some of them on them on my, on there because they're some of the best people I know. And you ask me why I miss the military, I'm going to tell you it's first more than anything, it's the people. Hmm. 1A is definitely the mission, but it's one is the, is the people. One, yeah. like yeah. 1A is very close to the mission, but one is the people. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, and also, like, that's also like, I also think why people struggle getting out of the military is that, that loss. Because with my own podcast, I, you know, I got out of the military 10 years ago and I, like I said, I fell flat on my face. 10 years later, I started a podcast and I'm reconnecting with shipmates or I'm reconnecting, not reconnecting, but I'm connecting now with three weeks ago, I interviewed a Vietnam Marine, Vietnam era Marine. And he was the guy who was meant to be a Marine 
and he was a guy who wanted to go to Vietnam. And he was a guy who was very proud of his service in Vietnam and came home from Vietnam into <sighs> an era I'm not real proud of our history. <laughs> but he also told stories that I was so happy about. And he was like, I went on to a college campus. I was there to find my girlfriend. I didn't know where she lived. I was wearing my Marine Corps uniform and I was in Southern California. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, Oh, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> but we also like did that whole story on our podcast. And I was like, I love hearing this kind of things because like, I wasn't even alive during Vietnam. I mean, it ended even in 1973. Some of you call it some 1975. I was born seven years later. Like I had no clue what Vietnam was, but I know it's a stain on, on our nation's history. I wish I could do more for those people that I wasn't even alive for. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because now I'm talking to a lot of, on my podcast, I talked to a lot of Afghanistan veterans and, you know, they're, they're looking at, you know, what we did, what we did just recently in Afghanistan and they're, <laughs> they're, they're almost our new Vietnam veterans. You know, we were there 20 years and we left that country. <laughs> we left all our, all our military equipment. We, we left 13 precious lives there. I mean, they lost their lives there. We abandoned our air bases. We abandoned our equipment and we abandoned our allies. We, I'm just like, we did, we did Vietnam again. We did. And, and these poor guys that, you know, I have one that works for me as an Afghanistan vet and uh, you know, they put their heart and soul into that country and, and they believe there was a purpose and they, they believe they, in their mission and I think it was the leaders that let everyone down. It wasn't the it wasn't the people on the ground doing the work. It was the the generals and the admirals uh, that let let them down. And it, and it's sad to know that there will be another generation of Vietnam vets now because of what we did. And that's as a veteran. As I watch that, I'm pretty upset about the whole thing. You know, I you know I wasn't there. It wasn't my war, but I know for a fact that. Um, a lot of people are hurting because of that, you know, and it's not, and it's not their fault. They, they gave a hundred percent and uh, you know, and then we just pull out. So that, I think that even makes it harder for transitioning veterans right now is that, you know, what did I do that for? You know, what was my purpose in life? You know, I felt that way, John, and I do have to correct you that that's not, I literally did feel that when I walled for three or four days and I, I talked to people and I wanted to feel that way. And I, the first guy I really talked about to it was someone I served with or it was, he, yeah, he was on my second ship and he said, and I said, like, what the fuck, what did we do? And he yeah. said, and you probably have heard this. And I finally realized it was true. Like we prevented another nine 11. Yeah, no, hundred percent. That, that, that is that, that's what gives you satisfaction and what helps you sleep at night knowing and, and the, and the, and the parents that lost children over there, the, the wives that lost husbands, the husbands that lost wives is that they protected our country for 20 years and we did not have another terrorist attack on our soil. So yeah, absolutely. We took the fight to the enemy. We kept them at bay for 20 years. <clears throat> I don't know what's going to happen going forward, but I think there was certainly, there was certainly something that was done. There, there was there was good things that that were done. I think the way we we pulled out is uh, it was shameful and embarrassing for our, our country. I really do. But that's, I mean, it's not it's not I'm not it's not a political statement. Just the just my feeling of how how we how we left. Right. Like we had oh, twenty years to plan yeah, our absolutely. departure. We had yeah. twenty years to plan our departure. You know, and and you know, military. We 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 know this stuff. We know how to do this right. We're the, yeah. we're the best military in the world. So we could have done that a little bit better. Yeah. And that was the thing is I'm, I served during that time. I was 2005 to 2010 and I really had a lot of questions. I said, what, what did we do? Like, this is just stupid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and my first chief, we still talk to this day and we have a great relationship and he even posted something today and he said, um, some of the extent of 
you know, all the, all the decisions that our leaders quotes, air quotes, um, all of the decisions that our leaders are making today are going to impact our children. And I said, that's really, really not a nice statement. I was like, I really think our children could do a much better job of leading the country. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, I have been... a three-year-old. Yeah. I'd vote for him or I'd, I'd pick him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What well, um what what were some of the things that you noticed um as you compare you know leadership from your days in the military you know you talked about having two great COs and then you kind of transition into government work and what were some of the differences you saw in leadership between the military and you know civilian leadership and you know what what were your what were some of your experiences. <laughs> I'm kind of, um, I probably have an asterisk on all of your guests because I went from, uh, you, know, you know, the military to the civilian military. And my uh, boss served during the Vietnam era. And then he literally opened a branch in the uh, Norfolk area where I was, uh, you know, I served in Norfolk and then he literally sort of developed the like maintenance and repair div uh, division for service ships as a department of NAVC, Naval Sea Systems Command in Norfolk. He was the kind of the, dev the guy who developed it circa like 1985. I joined them uh, 2010. <laughs> so it was, you know, he served... 30 years ago um <clears throat> a lot of us were military some probably 25 30 percent were civilians so i didn't have a ton of that <laughs> but since we were the federal government we don't do work we contract out all the work so i did have that experience of um it was really fun to continue to work with veterans and that's probably also continued like i went from active duty i went to the federal government i owned a small business that i was very proud to employ veterans and that's continuing my life to this day but when the federal government interacts with the you know civilian workforce you do see the lack of i'd probably say the most of it is probably accountability or it's mm. just like oh we meant it by thursday but how about friday morning mm. does it really yeah. matter or like we meant it's 1800 but maybe it's 1805 or as you're probably thinking you know 1800 means 1750 56 like right right 1758 you're starting to get a little like itchy like you're twitching um, but and more than anything, I th also think there's, there's management and there's leadership. And I do have to attribute this to you. I listened to a couple of your podcasts before we talked, of course, um, we're going to go back all the way to, to, I think it was episode eight or nine. It was Neil, uh, Neil Woodson. Yeah. 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 It was, uh authority and responsibility yeah yeah it's a big I mean, thing for all me. the way back because <laughs> i didn't learn that active duty i learned that as a midshipman yeah um because yeah. i did rtc and the very first class uh, rtc is rtc is they pay for college you basically are kind of they're serving for four years <laughs> um <laughs> but you take a class every semester and the very first class they teach you navy like in doc yeah and one of the first things they teach you is authority can be given you know which is kind of like giving your key to your car away hey you can go drive my car but if you wreck it it's still kind of my car and that's kind of well that's not a good example but like i also talked about like if my son goes and walks my dog my son's seven years old my dog's not a person. Neither of them 
in the as of the court has any legal responsibility or it, even any as of the court has any legal rights. I'm the one responsible. Yeah, yeah, no, you can. You but delegate. no, no civilian really gets that. Yeah, no, you delegate authority, but you can never delegate responsibility. You always as leader with hold, hold back that responsibility. Yeah, I always saw the opposite in corporate. We we delegated responsibility and then we and we we held on to authority. So we didn't give people the authority they needed to get the job done, but we held them accountable if they failed. At least that's what I my observation. We just just the opposite in in the corporate world and you know and me being ex-military, me being programmed to do just the opposite, I found myself I was a different kind of leader. I would, you know, people were like, you're, you're, you do things differently. And I'm like, I think it's because I was programmed. You know, I think same thing. I was ROTC as well. So I think I probably day yep. one, I'm like that, that one hit me really hard. And I'm like, okay, I'm, this is, this is my code. This is what I'm going to live by now, you know? And it, and I think that's why I've always led that way, but it's certainly in stark contrast to the way a lot of bosses lead. And I think that's uh, they could learn a lot from what we learned in the Navy. Yep. Yeah. So, um, go ahead. It's just fundamental though. It's yeah. That's the, that's the buck stops here. That's the, that's the position. Yeah. My father, my father told me, I think I was eight or 10. He said, that's, that's why so many people can't, can't succeed in life. It's, so many people just can't make a decision, stick by it and move forward. Even if it fails, you have to just say, I screwed up, but I yeah. still like, we already made the decision. It's, it's back there. Yep. But we're here. So what are we going to do now? Right. Right. But so many people just can't say like, I'm going to make the decision. So many people have to go like, do you want to decide? Do you want to decide? No, so many people can't just say like, I'm going to decide that this is what we're going to do. Yeah. And it's, that's where we're at. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. It seems common sense to me. And it, it, maybe it's just because the way we came, <laughs> came, yep. came up through. And I think that's why <laughs> probably the last 10 years, I felt like, I needed to teach, I needed to share, I needed to write because I felt like the stuff that's common sense to us is not common sense in uh, outside of the military, outs, uh, in, especially in corporate America. These things um, are foreign. And so yes. what I've tried to do with my writing is to try to make it less foreign, you know, make it to where people can understand these things through stories. I mean, mostly I tell stories and I think the stories help you paint a picture of, oh, okay, this is what leadership could be like <laughs> not the way it is to not the way i'm used to it so and yeah. i think those are great to tell in my new book i have like more than 50 sea stories and you know sea stories and they're fun uh i did i did edit them to be more politically correct and what have you but um but yeah those sea stories are great so the people can hear those and kind of get a feel for you know how we did things a little bit differently and i think I think those are, it's been great to get those on paper to tell those stories. So, yep. so let's talk about, uh, so you've got a podcast called Veterans in the Wild, right? So yes. um, how can people find out about the podcast? Where can they go to uh, find and subscribe to it? Well, I made it pretty difficult. You have to turn left and left and left and left again to get completely all the way back to get to the KISS principle, which I, I assume you probably heard about, right? Oh yeah. Keep it simple, stupid, right? <laughs> yep. So anywhere you look, it's going to be veterans in the wild online. It's veterans in um, I'm probably biggest on Instagram veterans in the wild. Um, trying to grow Instagram. I'm still learning the whole video thing, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, Instagram, YouTube, uh, Twitter, and Facebook. It's so it's anywhere I'm going to be. It's, it's veterans in the wild. Okay. That's great. And we're going to put links to the show notes in there so that everybody can find Veterans in the Wild podcast. Look it up. We're talking about veterans, veterans getting out and uh, that transition. So uh, Adam, I really appreciate you being on the show and sharing your experiences uh, coming out of the military and uh, really appreciate what you, what you shared today. Thank you. John, I loved it. Thanks for having me. 
Well, thank you. That's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.